I've combined and summarized the content from my psychopathology videos into this psychopathology revision video. If you don't understand any of the content I cover here, go to my longer videos for a full explanation. But if you just need a reminder of the key points quickly, this is the video for you. But don't just use this video. I've got a PsychBoost app, and it's designed to test your knowledge of all the topics in A-level psychology actively using flashcards. It's on iOS and Android, and you can use it for all of Paper 1 for free. If instead you want tutorial support videos with questions from all three papers, you can access over 16 hours of these, as well as hundreds of printable resources over on my Patreon. But enough of that, let's get going. Definitions of abnormality. Deviation from social norms. Social norms are unwritten behavioral expectations that vary depending on culture, time, and context. Social deviants are individuals who break the norms of their society and are seen as abnormal. Examples of behaviors showing high cultural specificity are tolerance to homosexuality, religious experience, and public displays of emotion. Evaluations. Using social norms does not impose a Western view of abnormality on other non-Western cultures. For this reason, it's argued diagnosing abnormality according to social norms is not ethnocentric. Defining people who move to a new culture as abnormal according to the new cultural norms can be inappropriate. For example, people from an Afro-Caribbean background living in the UK are seven times more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Failure to function adequately. When individuals cannot cope with the day-to-day -day challenges of daily life, such as maintaining personal hygiene. Rosenhall and Seligman's features, they show maladaptive behavior. Their irrational, unpredictable actions go against their long-term best interests. They show personal anguish, and observers feel discomfort in their presence. Evaluations. Failure to function respects the individual and their own personal experience which is something that other definitions, such as statistical infrequency and deviation from social norms, cannot do. Failure to function adequately only includes people who cannot cope. Psychopaths often function in society in ways that benefit them personally. Having low empathy can lead to success in business and politics. Statistical infrequency. Someone is mentally abnormal if their mental condition is very rare in the population. The rarity of the behavior is judged objectively using statistics comparing the individual's behavior to the rest of the population. The normal distribution curve shows a population's average spread of specific characteristics. For example, one element of diagnosis of intellectual disability disorder in the DSM-5 is having 70 IQ points or fewer, just over 2% of the population. Evaluations. Individuals who are assessed as being abnormal, according to statistical infrequency, have been evaluated objectively. This is better than other definitions that depend on the subjective opinion of a clinician. Not all statistically rare traits are negative. For example, IQs of 130 are just as statistically rare as IQs of 70. Also, there are common mental health conditions like anxiety. The NHS found 17% of people surveyed met the criteria for a common mental health disorder. Deviation from ideal mental health. A humanistic definition by Jehoda in 1958. Rather than defining abnormality, it defines features of ideal mental health. And deviation from these indicates abnormality. The six features are environmental mastery, autonomy, resisting stress, self actualization a positive attitude to yourself, and an accurate perception of reality. Evaluations. This is a holistic definition, as it considers multiple factors in diagnosis and provides suggestions for personal development. And deviation from ideal mental health does not simply state what is wrong, but also suggests how problems can be overcome. It's too strict a set of criteria to define mental health as it's challenging to achieve all of the requirements at any one time. Most people would be defined as abnormal. Characteristics of phobias, depression, and OCD. Phobias, behavioral. Avoidance, physically adapting normal behavior to avoid phobic objects. Panic, an uncontrollable physical response, for example, screaming and running. Failure to function, difficulty taking part in normal day-to-day -day activities. Emotional, anxiety, an uncomfortably high and persistent state of arousal. Fear. Intense emotional sensation of extreme and unpleasant alertness. It only subsides when the phobic object is removed. Cognitive. Irrational thoughts, fears, negative and irrational mental processes that include exaggerated belief in the harm the phobic object could cause. Reduced cognitive capacity due to the attentional focus on a phobic object. Depression. Behavioral. Reduction in activity level includes lethargy, lacking the energy needed to perform everyday activities, a change in eating behavior, either significant weight gain or weight loss, 
aggression to others or self-harm. Emotional. Sadness, a persistent very low mood. Guilt, linked to helplessness and a feeling that they have no value in comparison to other people. Cognitive, poor concentration. People with depression cannot give their full attention to tasks. Negative schemas, automatic negative biases when thinking about themselves, the world and the future. OCD, behavioral. Compulsions, behaviors performed repeatedly to reduce anxiety. For example, checking and cleaning behaviors. Avoidance, takes actions to avoid objects that trigger obsessions. Emotional, anxiety, an uncomfortably high and persistent state of arousal, making it difficult to relax. Depression, a consistent and long-lasting sense of sadness due to being unable to control thoughts. Cognitive, obsessions, intrusive, irrational, reoccurrent thoughts that tend to be unpleasant, catastrophic thoughts. Hypervigilance, a permanent state of alertness, looking for the source of obsessive thoughts. The behavioral approach to explaining and treating phobias. Explaining. According to behaviorists, behaviors like phobias are learned by experience. The two process model, Maurer, describes how phobias are acquired and maintained. Acquisition. Classical conditioning suggests a phobic object changes from being a neutral stimulus with no fear response to a conditioned stimulus with a fear response by being presented at the same time as an unconditioned stimulus that naturally causes a fear response, for example, the pain of being stung. Forming an association. Maintenance. Operant conditioning suggests avoidance behavior leads to a reduction in anxiety, which is a pleasant sensation. This negative reinforcement strengthens the phobic response. Generalization. A conditioned fear response is also experienced in the presence of stimuli that are similar to the conditioned stimulus. For example, a fear of bees could be generalized to other small flying insects. Evaluations. Watson and Rayner. Watson paired showing a rat with hitting a large metal pole behind a child's head, little Albert, creating a loud noise and scaring the child. A phobic response formed. Demonstrating phobias can be acquired through association. Donado showed while conditioning events like dog bites were common in participants with dog phobias at 56%, they were just as common in participants with no dog phobia at 66%. Behaviors theories of phobias have been practically applied to counter conditioning therapies, systematic desensitization, and flooding. As these treatments are effective, this suggests the behaviorist principles they are based on are valid. Humans also don't often display phobic responses to objects that cause the most pain in day-to-day life, such as knives or cars. However, phobias of snakes and spiders are more common. These phobias may be better explained by evolutionary theory. Treating. Behavioral therapies counter condition phobias, replacing the fear association with a relaxation-calm association. These therapies assume that fear and relaxation, as opposite emotions, cannot coexist, called reciprocal inhibition. Systematic desensitization, the therapist first teaches relaxation techniques like breathing exercises, then progresses through an anxiety hierarchy created by the client and the therapist from the least feared presentation to the most. A stepped approach is used with the client relaxing at each stage. This gradual exposure leads to the extinction of the fear association and a new association with relaxation is formed. Flooding involves immediate and full exposure to the maximum level of the phobic stimulus. This will cause temporary panic in the client, and they may attempt to escape. The clinician will keep the client in the situation until a temporary panic is stopped due to exhaustion, and the client is calm in the presence of the phobic object. Evaluations. Compared to flooding, the client controls systematic desensitization, making it a more pleasurable experience as they limit their anxiety. However, this slower process can result in more sessions for SD compared to flooding. Also, flooding isn't appropriate for older people. Both systematic desensitization and flooding are more effective in treating specific phobias, for example, fear of objects, than social phobias, as it's difficult to simulate social situations and interactions with unfamiliar individuals in a therapist's office. Garcia Palacitos found 83% of participants treated with VR exposure to spiders improved compared to 0% to the control group. This suggests the principles of systematic desensitization are valid, and the use of VR allows a wider range of phobias to be treated. Systematic desensitization and flooding's effects may be limited to the controlled environment of a therapist's office and may not translate to real-world experiences. For example, when confronted with numerous wild birds in the outside world, a phobia may resurface. Depression, the cognitive approach. Explaining. 
The cognitive approach argues depression is due to irrational thoughts from maladaptive internal mental processes. Beck's negative triad. Free schemas with persistent automatic negative bias. The self, also known as self schemas. Feeling inadequate or unworthy. The world, thinking people are hostile or threatening. The future, thinking things will always turn out badly. The negative triad develops in childhood but provides the framework for persistent biases in adulthood, leading to cognitive distortions and perceiving the world inaccurately. For example, overgeneralization. Ellis's ABC model, the A is the activating event. It can be anything that happens to someone, large or small. B is the belief. For people without depression, beliefs about A are rational. People with depression have irrational beliefs. C, consequence. Rational beliefs lead to positive consequences but irrational beliefs lead to negative consequences. Must debate true thinking. Thinking the world must be a certain way ultimately leads to disappointment. Evaluations. Grizzoli and Terry assessed the thinking styles of 65 women before giving birth and after. Found women with negative thinking styles were the most likely to develop postpartum depression. This supports the idea that faulty thinking leads to depression. People with bipolar depression experience manic phases. They feel extremely happy, overexcited, confident and focused. This is a problem for Beck's theory which explains depression as due to negative schemas, which are resistant to change. March showed CBT had an effectiveness rate of 81% after 36 weeks of treatment, the same as drug therapy. The fact these treatments are successful suggests the underlying cognitive explanations they are based on are valid. Cognitive theories depend on the assumption that the person with depression's thoughts is irrational. It could be depression is a reasonable response to the challenges they face, for example poverty and racism. Treating Beck's CBT and Alice's REBT change negative schemas and challenge irrational thoughts with cognitive restructuring. Beck's CBT The patient as a scientist. The patient generates and tests hypotheses about the validity of their irrational thoughts. When they realise their thoughts don't match reality, this will change their schemas, and the irrational thoughts can be discarded. Thought catching, identifying irrational thoughts coming from the negative triad of schemas. The patient is also set homework tasks. For example, keeping a diary to identify sources of negative thinking. Ellis's REBT, Rational Motive Behaviour Therapy. A development of the ABC model, adding D for dispute and E for effect. Dispute, the therapist confronts the client's rational beliefs. Empirical arguments challenge the client to provide evidence for their rational beliefs, while logical arguments attempt to show the beliefs don't make sense. Effect, the reduction of irrational thoughts, restructured beliefs, leading to better consequences in the future. Evaluations. March, compared to CBT, drug therapy, fluoxetine, or a combined treatment. At 36 weeks, CBT and drug therapy had an effectiveness rate of 81%, and combined 86%. CBT also had a more significant reduction in suicidal events than drug treatment. Some people with depression are too severely depressed to engage with the demands of CBT. Completing homework, challenging irrational thoughts, and attending sessions require motivation and commitment. Advocates of CBT say it empowers patients and gives a sense of personal efficacy, enabling them to take control of their lives and make positive changes. In contrast, drugs often require a passive role where patients are reliant on biological intervention. REBT and CBT may be overly focused on the present and how to restructure how the client thinks about their current situation cognitively. Clients may want to discuss severe trauma in their past or actually improve their present situation. Hey there, as you're still watching, I'm guessing you'll find this video useful. As I release content right up to the exams, don't forget to subscribe so you know when new videos are uploaded. Also, as this video is being released, I'm on around 50,000 subscribers, and I'd love to get to 100k at some point in the next few years. OCD, the biological approach. Explaining. The genetic explanation for OCD is the disorder is inherited. Genetic analysis has revealed around 230 separate candidate genes, found more frequently in people with OCD. The CERT gene affects reuptake in the serotonin system. Other identified genes include gene 9, COMP gene, and 5-HT1D beta gene. Due to the large number of candidate genes, OCD appears to be polygenetic, meaning a predisposition to OCD requires a range of genetic changes. The neural explanation for OCD includes low serotonin levels. The low level of serotonin is likely due to being removed too quickly from the synapse before it has been able to transmit its signal, influence, the postsynaptic cell. The worry circuit is a set of brain structures including the orbital frontal cortex, rational decision making, the basal ganglia system, especially the caudate nucleus, and the thalamus.
Communication between these structures and the worry circuit appears to be overactive, people with OCD, resulting in obsessive thinking. Evaluations. The stat. Dizygotic twins have a 31% concordance rate, and monozygotic twins have 68%. Monozygotic and dizygotic twins grow up sharing similar environments. This suggests that the additional shared DNA is responsible for the increased concordance. The correlation in twin studies does not equal causation. As the concordance rate for monozygotic twins is 68%, not 100%, the level we expect for an entirely genetically determined psychological feature, there must be some role for the environment. The diathesis stress explanation combines a genetic vulnerability to OCD, the diathesis, with an environmental factor, the stressor, needed for the disorder to develop. Chroma showed 54% of 256 people with OCD reported at least one traumatic life event. Samara. A meta-analysis demonstrates SSRIs are more effective than placebos, suggesting there is a biological aspect to OCD. However, despite altering levels of serotonin in the synapse within hours, these drugs take weeks to reduce symptoms. Treating. Drug therapies. The primary class of drugs used to control the symptoms of OCD are a group of antidepressant drugs called SSRIs. For example, furoxetine, also known as Prozac. SSRIs are called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They only influence, select, serotonin in the brain. As reuptake inhibitors, they inhibit, slow down, the reuptake process in the synapse. Therefore, serotonin is still present in the synaptic cleft and continues to stimulate the postsynaptic neuron. This decreases anxiety by normalizing the activity of the worry circuit. Benzodiazepines work by enhancing a neurotransmitter called GABA, slowing the central nervous system and resulting in general relaxation. Tricylics and SNRIs increase serotonin and neuroadrenaline. These drugs can be effective when SSRIs fail, but because they work on multiple neurotransmitters, they're non selective, they tend to have more intense side effects. Evaluations Samaro, a meta analysis combining 17 studies comparing SSRIs to placebo, found SSRIs significantly reduced symptoms of OCD compared to placebos between 6 and 17 weeks post treatment, suggests drug therapy is effective in the short term. Goldacre argues most research studies on drug therapies are conducted by the pharmaceutical companies that created them. This means the companies have a financial interest in showing that drugs are effective, potentially biasing results. In comparison to psychological therapies like CBT, drug therapy is relatively inexpensive to the NHS and potentially a more convenient treatment for the patient, as CBT requires the patient to find time for multiple sessions of a trained therapist. Many patients prefer CBT, Drug therapy can have a range of potential side effects. In Samaro, it was found nausea, headache, and insomnia were the most common side effects. Don't forget you can now test yourself on the Psych Pathology Unit with the Psych Boost app. All of the topics in Paper 1 are free, and you can get it on iOS or Android. If you want to see model answers to Psych Pathology questions or access my other resources, there's also Patreon. Speaking of Patreon, I do want to thank all of my patrons for their support. With the help of all of these students and teachers, I'm able to teach part-time, so I can work on the main mission of Psych Boost, the development of a free-to-watch and, hopefully, high-quality A-level psychology course. And a special thank you to Kat Posnick and Ahmed Romani for supporting at the developer level. So, thanks to them, good luck with your revision, and I'll see you in the next Psych Boost video.